and our disciple Wisconsin and up uh, vision, you know, that two to three teams of two to three for every county of Wisconsin, that comes from a stat that we heard from uh, Justin Long, who's a, a DMM researcher, sharing that a team of two to three can reach a people group of 100,000. So for some counties of Wisconsin, you know, we need multiple teams, and for some, we have more cows than people in that county, right? But, but we've been praying into that and asking the Lord to birth movements here that would spread to the most unreached around the world. And we're super excited to be able to host uh, Roy Moran and Jim Egley, who both of those brothers have been a, a blessing in, in my life, and I know in Rock as well, and likely for many of you. So with that in mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it over to these guys, and we're anticipating the Lord's going to do some powerful things. Well, okay. thanks, Marcus. Yeah. Yeah, I'll let you uh, share about new generations, Roy. Okay. Or whatever else you want to share. <laughs> yeah. uh, 1957, uh, a guy and his wife started something called the San Jose Rescue Mission. And there was a number of um, just faithful acts of service to under resourced people that, that happened in that process, uh, but moved the the timeline forward to the early 2000s, uh, the, the leadership team at uh, the uh, city team was really restless about the impact that they were having. They were meeting in a, um, an executive retreat and someone posed a question. They said, um, from 1957 to now, so it was, it was early 2000s, <clears throat> we have been given $75 million dollars uh, if someone walked into the door today and wrote a check for $75 million, would we spend it the same way we spent the last $75 million? And the answer to that question was no. Uh, we would find a different way because they had discovered that uh, even though they had done a lot of good things in the San Francisco South Bay area, and uh, but they hadn't made any lasting impact. The moment they would move a staff member out of a neighborhood, um, the, the hole that they left would just fill back up with the evil and, and poverty and all kinds of stuff. And they just couldn't find a sustainable way to let the gospel get planted and, and move. About that time, um, they ran into a few different relationships. So they ran into uh, a guy named David Watson. They ran into a guy named Jerry Trousdale. They, Jerry Trousdale, uh, had connections with um, Inusa Jow and uh, Shadanka Johnson. And uh, through those, <clears throat> what seemed to be chance meetings at that point, uh, caused a, an opportunity to, to take what David Watson had learned in um, Northern India and attempt to plant it in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so they started um, aggressively attempting to plant the gospel in sub-Saharan Africa in a way that it would multiply. And so um, it, it took, um, and many of you have read the book Miraculous Movements, uh, and in reading that you read this incredible, beautiful story. What you don't read is the ugly story, which leads to the beautiful story. So it's sort of a beauty out of ashes type thing. Um, and um, for about six years, they labored in training and, and attempting to figure out these, um, these principles of multiplicative disciple making. What would it look like to plant the gospel in the way that it would repeat itself um, over time with ordinary average people and, and really move? And um, so that organization, City Team, um, had an incredible run. And, and then the CEO of that organization uh, retired. And so as city team was hiring a new CEO, they came to the realization that they had this resource intensive uh, ministry to the under-resourced and they had this international church planting ministry. Um, they seemed to be two different things. And so I was on the board of city team at the time and uh, we, we made a decision to uh, plant to uh, a new organization. Uh, we felt like that the organization that was the rescue mission needed uh, to really refocus and, and be what it was and that the international church planting needed to be what it was. And the two were kind of disparate in some ways. Um, and so we planted uh, the organization New Generations back in 2017. 
Harry Brown, uh, who had been with City Team for 40 plus years, became the, the, the new leader and the, the team that the Miraculous Movements team, for lack of a better uh, description, stayed intact and became new generations. And so they've been in, um, uh, in operation as an independent organization now for uh, about three years, uh, give or take a few months. Um, we're we're uh, in, engaged in over 400 plus uh, unreached people groups uh, in actually 52 countries. Uh, so um, this year uh, we're, we're approaching about 70,000 churches planted, over 2 million um, new disciples, probably uh, half of those uh, coming out of a, uh, a Muslim faith. But, you know, it's a great one, and it's been an incredible opportunity for me to be embedded in that team, to learn from them, be mentored by them. Both Jim and I have traveled extensively and, and been with uh, a lot of those folks. So they, they're our main teachers. So we both operate under that flag. Cool. Um, I wanted to go, thanks Roy, I wanted to go over some of our objectives and um, here's where we're going. Here's what we want to accomplish. Um, we want you through this uh, weekend, through this workshop, to get clarity around the basics of making disciple makers. How do we make disciple makers? Multiplicative disciple making that in time turns into movements. Uh, we also just want you to get encouraged and get fresh faith and vision. Um, you know, by the end of this, I want you to feel empowered, more empowered than you do now to do the impossible. And then uh, we want you to hear God and have clear action plans. You know, as you emerge from this workshop, our goal is that you think, okay, it's, we know what God wants us to do, and we know the next steps uh, for moving forward in that. Um, a couple uh, things, first of all, the flow. Um, what we're doing this evening is we'll look at the practices, the habits of disciple making movements and making disciple makers. We'll look at a one case study in a local church. And then we want to end just by again listening to scripture, listening to God. And um, we're asking you to do something. It shouldn't be too hard, but it is different. And that is we're asking you not to talk to anyone or text anyone before breakfast tomorrow. Like when you leave this session tonight, um, you know, if you need to make a quick phone call or something, uh, okay. But then we want you just to be silent to just uh, be more attentive to God. And then you will meet for what we would like you to do is to meet for breakfast virtually tomorrow at eight. So your team, you know, if you can't do it, no problem. But we, if possible, we would like your team or that if you're here by yourself and we place you on a team, um, you meet with that team. Um, virtually over breakfast and you can do that you know use google hangouts facebook messenger video facetime skype whatever that's up to you uh, but then we'll reconvene tomorrow morning at 8 45 and uh we'll have a short talk on the three paths of making disciple makers as a local church or ministry and then we're gonna uh, just have fun the rest of the morning uh, shaping plans and we'll we'll guide you through that it's kind of a step-by-step -step, very interactive process that you'll do as a team and then you'll get um, we'll interact around some of those plans tomorrow um, so again tonight it's we'll look at the basics we'll look at this case study we'll end by listening to God um, but one thing I want to say before we go on from that to get, I told some of the people that came on early on, um, we encourage you to be fully present. 
like you're not going to get much out of this if you're not fully present. So I put my phone on airplane mode. I would encourage you to do the same unless you know you've got a family member in the hospital or something. Um, you know, just kind of tell God, hey, the next between now and noon on Saturday, you're in charge of the world. Okay, I'll take charge again tomorrow at noon. But God, could you handle things until noon tomorrow? Okay. And then um, also, you're probably on your computer. And I encourage you to like close your mail program, close any, close your browser. Actually, if you close your browser, Zoom will work much better. Your browser is a memory hog. Close your browser, you know. Uh, any, anything that might distract you, we encourage you to, um, you know, hit control Q or command Q if you're on a Mac and close those things. Um, okay, so here's, um, I'm gonna ask a few questions and I, you know, you can jump in, but you'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, there's a lot of us on the call, so when you share, keep your responses short so that other people have time to respond as well. Um, but yeah, what what are what's in the picture here? What do you see? Maps, right? We see maps. With the maps, um, could you use any of these maps for anything? You know, you, you, you couldn't, could you? Um, mm. There's certain maps you use for different things. And I, I want mm. you to think about maps. Uh, and here's where I want you to, um, you know, can, why are maps useful? Why are maps useful? What do, you, what do we use maps for? Does somebody jump in? What's coming to your mind? To find a place. Yeah. Get, get from point A to point B. Get from point A to point B, right. You're, you're this place, you want to get that other place, right? What else? To not get lost. Not get lost, right. Can you have maps in your mind? You know, do you have Simple maps ones. in your mind or maps just physical things? You can have maps in your mind. Yeah, you can, can't you? You do have maps in your mind, don't you? We do have maps in our mind. Um, what are some problems with maps? Have you ever had a problem with maps? You know, maybe, I'm, maybe I should have GPS up here. Um, you know, we don't use maps much anymore, do we? But um, what are some problems with maps? Not updated regularly. Not updated. Uh, they're hard to refold. Yeah, they're hard to refold. <laughs> yeah. They don't Could depend on the there's a construction zone or something like that. Exactly. They're not current necessarily, are they? Maybe there's a new road there, or maybe that road is closed. Yeah. What else don't they take into consideration? They don't do any good if you don't know where you're starting from. Oh, brilliant. That's a brilliant point, Aaron. When do you need to change maps? Uh, when you go to a different location or wow. area. Right, you cross the border, right? And you're like, wait, I'm off the map, right? You know, um, a thing I've thought of too, like if you're ever visiting overseas, like if you're in London, if you go underground, you need the underground map. It's called the underground map. You know, the underground map is the, over, the above ground map won't help you on the London underground. Um, it's a totally different map uh, to get from this point to that point on their subway, which they call the underground, um, you need an underground map, right? You're, you're, you're in a different territory, right? 
Any other thoughts on that? When do you need to change maps? Well, maps can be outdated. So right. if you're in a new era, um, new streets or new buildings have been constructed. Right, you don't want an old map, do you? I mean, if I stop at a rest area on the highway, I don't know how it is in your state, but in my state, you know, like, this is the 2020 Illinois roadmap. And you're like, oh, I'm taking that because I have the 2015 in my glove compartment. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what we, basically that's what we're dealing with tonight and tomorrow. We're thinking about maps. Um, we have maps, we have, we all have maps. We have maps, you know, when we go to do church, when we go to help someone grow in their Christian life, when we think about outreach or how to make disciples, we all have maps in our minds, but we often aren't aware of those maps. And um, I'll share a bit about this later, but yesterday I was, I was meeting with, I'm not, I used to be a pastor and now I'm just a church member, um, a missionary that's a member of the church where I was on staff. But the pastors told me, uh, you know, what we used to do isn't working. You know, for decades we did this. And would you talk to us about disciple making movements? Because we think it's kind of like they were saying, we drove across a border and our maps don't work anymore. Um, and so that's what we're thinking about here. We're thinking about maps. So as you think about it, um, you know, maybe you, there's maps we're all using right now and maybe we need to rethink those maps. And so that's what we'll be doing. Um, today we're kind of evaluating maps. You're, you're gonna be helping me look at um, some of my experience when I share a case study, but then tomorrow you'll be doing some mapping. And um, so that's what we're about here. Um, okay, so this is where it was. Three action principles. A lot of times if you come to a workshop like this, it's based on knowledge. And they're just like, it's, it's you know, like drinking from a, um, a fire hose. And they're just like, you need to know this, this, and this. Well, we're actually not giving you a lot of new materials. We're, we're working less on knowledge and more on understanding that clarifies our action. So tonight we're working more on understanding, tomorrow we're working more on action. So this is a different kind of uh, training or workshop than you're used to. And then, um, uh, I already mentioned that, you know, just we're, we're inviting you to be present. I know that's hard because it's Friday and you've had a long week. <laughs> so that's why we're making things very interactive. Uh, but then just have a sense of discovery. Like, God, what, what new things do you want me to learn? What new things do you want me to consider? And then again, we want you to um, just have a sense of expectancy. Like, God, God, I can guarantee you this. God wants to do bigger things than you've seen him do before. So just let's just have fun and be open and have a sense of expectancy. Um, Roy, do you want me to share the slides as you go through the six habits? Or do you, um, and you can add other comments, Roy, now if you want, but um, or do you want to do that yourself, or do you want to just talk? <laughs> Is Roy here? Why don't you work the slides and I'll just talk through them? Okay. I'll go ahead and put them up then. Proverbial mute button on. Oh, okay. Very good. If we were together, uh, sitting in a coffee shop, I'd be drawing this on the back of a napkin. Um, and, um, so I, I contemplated drawing it, um, on the whiteboard here, but, um, I don't think it comes across quite as well. Um, so you have to use your imagination a little bit, uh, assume that 
you know, you've got your uh, cappuccino, your latte, or whatever your uh, favorite drink is, and uh, we're together. And so um, we want you to uh, kind of understand the big picture here uh, of what we're looking at. Um, so, Jim, you just want to go to the... Is that the, explain? It is. I, I have uh, our objectives up there. Oh, okay, sorry. I displayed the wrong screen. Very good. Just give me the, yeah, the habits and spiral. Yeah, there we go. So, so if we think about this for a moment, um, uh, I want to go back even before all this stuff ended up on a sheet of paper and draw a big circle on this paper. Uh, maybe even before that, I want to draw a crown up at the top. Um, you know, there was a creator God who had a huge heart, uh, wanting to share himself uh, with uh, his with the creation, um, his his glory, his uh, revealed goodness. Uh, he was eager to to share that, and so he created a world, and and that world uh, came you know straight out of his heart. But I think uh, all of us realize that that world he created is the world we live in right now. And it's, it's kind of messed up. Um, it, it is not what he intended. Uh, our forefathers uh, really screwed that up royally. And so what he decided to do was to leave heaven and come to earth. Uh, and if you draw a cross right in the middle of that heart right now, um, it, it would represent you know, what, what God chose to do uh, to restore uh, the family that he had first started to create. Uh, in, in the original creation. And so when Jesus got to earth, his strategy was a very unique strategy. Uh, he, he chose to work through a small group of people. His first uh, call to them or his first uh, request of them was a, a request of obedience, follow me. And so he created a, a group of people uh, that we call disciples. And so those, those first uh, men and women that Jesus called to him became his primary way of reaching uh, and restoring uh, the earth that, that he had created. And so these disciples, he, he brought into a close relationship with himself, and they got a chance to see him model the fact that he did not do anything that the Father didn't tell him to do that Jesus was a representative on this earth uh, of his heavenly father. And so he taught them to begin their spiritual journey with a, an intimate relationship with uh, their father. And so for us, we realize, you gonna put the icons up there, Jim? Yeah, you Can want you, all of them? Yeah, just throw them all up there because you, you probably don't have them in the order. Um, so. Jesus down here in, in this this purple corner here, as I thought of it, these disciples discovered who Jesus was, that he was the Son of God, and, and they began to follow him in, in obedience. And so they, they developed this relationship with him so that their primary imprint uh, with uh, Jesus was to realize that following his example of developing intimacy with the Father. So they began to realize that keeping company with God, that having a, a a spirit of submission uh, to this creator God who is now their father. And so they began this life of prayer. In fact, it was one of the only things they ever asked Jesus about, teach us to pray. And he gave them that model prayer in, in Matthew 6. And so when we think about this whole concept of following Jesus and making disciples, we realize that, that it begins with prayer. It begins with intimacy with the father. It begins coming out of his heart uh, and his heart was to restore his creation. Um, and then we operate on the same model with Jesus. Jesus not only taught us to have this uh, posture of humility and submission to our Father and, and to pray, uh, to ask him to bring his character and his will to this earth, but he also engaged. He engaged lost people. Jesus left heaven, came to earth, as <clears throat> Eugene Peterson so aptly put it in the message that Jesus moved into the neighborhood, you know, as he translated uh, John 1, 14, this idea of, of engaging 
uh, people who are far from God. And so in this process of, of creating movements or creating disciple making movements or making disciples or making multiplying disciples, um, it, it begins in prayer coming out of the heart of God, but, but it starts with engaging those people around us who uh, are not yet in a father child relationship with God. Jesus taught his disciples something really unique in, in Matthew 10 and Luke 10. Uh, he encouraged them to find those people of spiritual interest who are already healing their community, but yet <clears throat> their healing would be exponentially uh, engaged when they began a relationship with Jesus and their father. And so we call them persons of peace. Uh, Luke 10, Jesus says, offer peace to people. And when they offer the peace back, stay right there. Work through that person. Uh, let them be the channel or the guide through which the gospel is planted in that social network. Um, the way you work with that person is that you draw them around a table, uh, not necessarily a table, but, um, and you begin to read the Bible together. You begin to get your fingerprints on the Bible. You begin to look at what God has to say about life. And, um, and in this process, we call it the discovery process, uh, you ask, um, people do it a little bit differently in their place. Uh, we ask seven different questions on a regular basis. And one of those questions coming down to, to dealing with the scriptures is, you know, if this is what God is saying, what are we going to do about it? So it has this really unique opportunity to sit around the table, read the Bible, hear from God, and hold one another accountable for what Jesus wants to do in our lives. It's very similar to what Jesus did when he worked with his disciples, when he first called them, uh, he asked them to obey. He, he called them into an obedient relationship with him. And so we help people understand that, you know, if God is the creator of the universe, as Jesus is the smartest person ever lived, um, it stands a reason if we were looking for advice on life that we might go to him and listen to what he has to say, because he is the creator of life. And so we give people the opportunity to discover what God has to say about life by getting their fingerprints on the Bible. As they begin to embrace the cross and follow Jesus in obedience, uh, many of them getting baptized and, and acknowledging publicly that they are now following Jesus, uh, they have this natural inclination to, uh, to move together um, in these little apostolic communities that, that want to continue the work of God uh, in their world. Uh, they assemble together. Sometimes we refer to those as churches, but that word has um, got a lot of uh, baggage with it today. And so sometimes we refer to them as biblically functioning communities or just simply the Greek word, ekklesia. It's where people learn to live in obedience to God. Uh, they learn to love one another in community, and they learn to continue to stay on mission uh, for their father. They get a chance to get involved in the family business. And that family business is restoring God's order to this world. And so uh, as a part of that whole process, as these uh, believers now begin to assemble and begin to strategize about how to reach out into those other pockets of losses that exist in their particular area, um, it, there's a natural process of multiplication that takes place. Now, Jesus came to give away his life and following his model and being shaped in his image we learn to give away our lives. We learn to multiply. And so we discover <clears throat> in this process that when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he gave it to ordinary people. He didn't give it to uh, a group of ordained people, uh, but he gave it to ordinary people. And so this idea of if we live in a world where we desire for every man, woman, and child to have a repeated opportunity to see, hear, and respond to Jesus, then we're going to have to get every man, woman, and child that calls Jesus their father, their savior, and, and their Lord, and their king. We're going to have to get every one of those people into the game. And so this process uh, requires multiplication so that as people assemble in these small ecclesias, they realize that their mission is to multiply, to do it again, and do it again, and do it again. Um, and so they begin back into this the spiral and this journey as we move around you see these arrows moving around here represent the fact that um, for those of us who have been at this for a while we realize that, that this is not, not a new strategy that we're just implementing um, this is a way of life uh, this is a, a lifestyle uh, it's a discipled life and so 
that my, maybe my first lap around the track uh, is learning to be a disciple. Uh, as David Watson so aptly says in his Contagious Disciple Making book, you can't make a disciple unless you are a disciple. So that first lap is, is learning to be a, a disciple, learning to grow in obedience to all that, that Jesus uh, has taught us. The second lap around that track in that journey is becoming a multiplying disciple or a disciple maker. Uh, that is, I, I get a generation, uh, I get a child in this process. And so as we keep moving around this spiral, we discover that each of these icons represents a toolbox, a toolbox that helps me continue in this life. And so my first time around, I pick up a tool or two or three. My second time around, I pick up even more tools. My third time around, I pick up more tools. My fourth time around, I pick up more tools and I become more and more effective at understanding what it looks like. Because all of us, unfortunately, are coming out of a kind of Christianity that was really uh, focused on addition. And we're trying to move into a kind of relationship with Jesus that is about multiplication. And so there's some deconstruction that has to take place. And so this journey, as we keep moving, we learn to be a disciple. We learn to make disciples. We learn to be a multiplying disciple maker. So we not just have one generation, we don't have just children, we have grandchildren. And then we keep moving around this, and some of the folks that, that uh, I've had the privilege to, to relate to are now movement catalysts. Uh, they are disciple makers that have multiple generations, five, six, seven, sometimes 20 generations of disciples that are moving. Each time you move around that, it takes a different type of training, a different type of mindset, uh, a, a different way of looking at things. And so this journey that we're on, uh, takes quite some time, um, and it, it takes, um, you know, probably uh, the better part of a year to two years to really change our mindsets, and then it takes another two or three years to even get fruitful in this process. So I like to think of these arrows as my journey, and I'm just going to keep moving around this uh, until God allows me to be a part of, of seeing, you know, multiple four and fifth generations move you know, away from me and, and this kind of movement that we talk about. Um, I was in a meeting today where I had a chance to hear the new number uh, for movements in the world. Uh, Justin Long's name was mentioned earlier here. Uh, Justin's been tracking it. Maybe the last thing you might have heard was a thousand some odd movements. And Justin is reporting today that there's over 1,300 movements now being reported you know, in, in the world. Um, and that's my dream and my long. And I, I, I feel like for me, if I stay on this journey long enough, uh, God is gonna be faithful to let me be a part of that. Amen, thanks, Roy. Um, we, if, you, if you don't have the chat box open yet, you might wanna open it. Um, you may notice Marcus and I were putting some things in there. We know some of you have been teaching the habits of disciple making. Maybe you have, maybe you have five, maybe you have seven. I think you can probably see the overlap here. Sometimes we joke around and say, don't listen to the false prophets and heretics that, that, that say there's seven habits or five habits, which I was teaching a year ago or two years ago. <laughs> but, um, if, you, if your church is using a little different grid or uh, the network you're a part of, that's fine. Um, there's, a, there's a few different ways to slice and dice this, but we want you to understand the heart of this. And as Ross was saying, um, the key thing we want you to realize is we're, we're not talking about methods. We're talking about following Jesus in what he modeled and what he called us to do. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to put you into your teams. And if you print it out, the handouts ahead of time, uh, great. You've got some worksheets there. If you didn't print them out, uh, no problem, because the exercises are pretty simple. But what we want you to do in your groups is you're going to talk about from what was just shared, uh, what did you hear? You know, what stood out to you and um, what does it mean? What are the practical, what are some of the practical implications of that? So you should have 
a um, sheet that looks, you know, so you should have a sheet that looks like what's on the right. It's page four of the handouts, but you can see it's not complicated. Just grab a piece of paper, um, a blank piece of paper, scratch paper, whatever. And then um, someone in your group, if you haven't already appointed a scribe, someone in your group should put that on a PowerPoint. Um, and we, you should have gotten one, or if you didn't let us know, we can drop it, we can email it to you, but, uh, or you can recreate it. But the PowerPoint, again, just looks like this, and we want your uh, scribe to write down what did you hear and what does it mean? So that's what we're gonna do. Marcus is gonna put you into your teams and uh, what stood out to you? What did you hear? Uh, what does it mean? What are the implications of that as you think about it? 20 minutes with our teams, right? From, yeah. uh -huh. All right, excellent. Hey, Ross, would you unmute and ask Holy Spirit to speak to us as we jump into our team discussion? Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, uh, Lord, I just ask for your presence to come in power now and uh, open our hearts and our minds uh, to be able to uh, articulate uh, those things which we just heard about. And uh, Lord, I... Um, Pray just for, like Jim uh, spoke before, just for, for clarity and, and in depth of understanding uh, and application as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, excellent. So we have, first is the Stevens Point team with Rebecca and Thomas and Jim and Becky. Okay. So would, would your scribe, if you push share screen in the middle on the bottom, it'll show you, it'll show us what you have on your PowerPoint slide of what you typed out there. All right. We've got to, we got to try to figure out how to get to our. Right, just do that. Okay. My techie guy tells me what, how right, to do it. And then click on the PowerPoint. Tell now, I want to tell everyone while they're sharing, <laughs> while, while these different teams are sharing, we won't have every team share every time, but We'll have a few teams share each time, but while they're sharing, we want everyone listening for patterns. What are patterns that you see? So go ahead and share. Unmute yourself if you're muted and share. Okay, okay so um, what we heard, uh, you can see here on our slide is that working the spiral or the circle is a journey. The timetables vary, but there's a feeling of movement. It's a fluid process. <clears throat> the movement is a marathon, not a sprint. The cycle continues and we gain tools and skills as we repeat the cycle. Um, and then there was uh, more of an editorial than what we heard that just the challenge of using the technology <coughs> to, to be in a, a implementation lab like this uh, takes a little effort, more effort to stay focused and not get distracted. So. Uh, that's more parenthetical. Um, and then as we reflected on what does this mean to us, uh, that we thought it, what we've learned is you have to have many pairs of shoes because you're going to be going through the spiral and walking this journey out for a long time. And you might as well travel light because you'll get weary from taking burdens with you. Um, keep your eyes open looking for opportunities. And uh, if you don't stay close to the center of the spiral and being in relationship with the Lord and dialogue and prayer, none of the rest of it's going to be fruitful and really uh, bear much in the end. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, anybody else on that team want to add anything? No, Rebecca was our spokesperson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, okay, good. So um, did you capture that? Um, Marcus? You know what, Jim, I forgot to take a screenshot of it. I'll do that starting now. Okay, so, um, <coughs> okay, who's the next team, Marcus? Next, we have the, the New Day Wausau, team one with Aaron, 
and Michelle. All right, um, let me share. This is Russ. I'm going to share my screen here. Thank you, Russ. All right, you should have it there. Maybe in the background at all. Um, so uh, for what did you hear, Jesus gave the Great Commission to ordinary people, not ordained people, um, engaging the people with the Bible at hand. And it can be a long journey, and it takes many iterations to, to fully change our mindsets. Um, and we should be in the business of restoring God's order to this world. Uh, so, you know, kind of what, what does it mean? We've thought that God's going to use us where we are because we are the ordinary people. Um, and we're on the right track and not to be discouraged with how long it's going to take to change mindsets and that we, we have what we need and to keep staying in the word and working together to multiply. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else on that team? Anything you want to add or comment on? Okay, they did. They did, they covered it. Okay, next. Let's do a couple more teams. Uh, next one, Marcus. Excellent. Yeah, next we have the the other New Day team. So team two from New Day. Awesome. All right, this is Tiffany. I am going to share my screen here, hopefully. Thanks, Tiffany. Okay, so what did we hear? We heard that it's going to take time. And we also heard um, a little bit about the deconstruction process. Um, so what does that mean? Um, that it's going to take time. It means that it, it may take two years or longer if you aren't a disciple yourself um, to gain the momentum or feel comfortable um, with the process. And then um, for the deconstruction process, um, we need to unlearn what we have been taught that church is. Okay, cool. Anybody else? on the team want to comment feel free to jump in okay who's the next team and again we're the rest of us are looking for patterns next is northwoods vineyard team one with nate and shelley Okay, I was voluntold that I have to do this. Thanks, Thank you. Jess. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to try to share my screen with you guys. Let's see. Um, can you guys see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so we heard, let's see, um, that this takes time, patience. Perseverance, lots of waiting. Um, this isn't a quick thing. Um, that finding a person of peace, uh, finding and working with leaders can be messy, and we're trying to embrace the messiness of it all, uh, which is both exciting and hard, <laughs> I guess. Um, and then seeking the willing, not the equipped. Um, so, yeah. And then um, apparently, God's way and plans are better than ours new discovery for all of us um and multiplication rather than addition so yeah hey interesting it's interesting the way different people are pulling different insights out could you say more jess about what you mean by seeking the willing not the equipped yeah i think um and feel free guys and shelly to jump in but you know talking about the people that are showing interest and are wanting who are showing up, I guess, you know, um, kind of being, I guess, the servants rather than, you know, reaching for the towel, not the title kind of thing. Um, and maybe they don't necessarily have the skills or whatever, but they're willing. And so from that, you know, God can mold, he can work through that. Um, 
yeah and there's so much benefit to that usually there's they're a lot more humble you know in that right right okay very good Thank you. um yeah anybody else on the team want to comment on that or anything else Okay, and then who is the next team, Marcus? Let's do one more. Okay, yeah, sounds good. I, I'm gonna, I'll share screen and do our team. And I think Sweetbridge is gonna share for us. Uh, so similar, it can take two to three years, you know, that commitment, and it can be discouraging potentially. And then in terms of having like a humble heart, a broken, brokenness, um, realizing that, you know, we are his children, his disciples, and just being humble before him, the fact that he would use us in this process, understanding that it is for the long haul, you know, it's a way of life. So don't, you know, get discouraged by that essentially. And then also um, that idea of disciples and groups growing away from us. So you know, will that movement fall apart if we're removed from that equation? You know, is it self-sustaining? Okay, what does it mean? That mark oh. is not actually able to see the bottom. Oh, is that right? Is that any better? I think I think maybe make your uh, make your window bigger, Bridget. There we go. So in terms of what does it mean, you know, there are a lot of people that don't know Jesus and they need spiritual healing, and um, there's a sense of urgency with that. So in terms of you know, you can't put it off for another day. It's today is the day, and today is the time to seize the opportunity. Um, and in terms of bathing this whole process in prayer, that's very important just to continue to pray, pray, pray. Um, we need people to be ready to hear and to listen. And that theme again of don't get discouraged. It's not a waste of time. It's part of an ongoing building process. Um, and then the idea as well to not get caught up in the system. You know, these things can be out of order. So it doesn't have to be point A to B to C to D. It can be A to D to C and you know like God doing it his own way um, and then in terms of like the methods and the tools again they're helpful things but at the end of the day to continue rooting ourselves in scripture and using those things as a means to an end and then that idea as well if we're not in the equation does this all keep going um, so ensure, ensuring that we're not the center of it it's not really about us but we're tools to be used <laughs> Okay, excellent. Thank you. Anybody uh, else on the team want to say anything on that? Okay, so now let's talk about it as a larger group. What, um, what were some themes you heard? So you'll have to unmute yourself. I keep hearing over and over again how, how it's going to take a long time. And uh, I, it makes me think of something. Somebody said this. It was really smart. And it went something like this, but I'm not going to get it exactly right. When asked, when is the best time to plant a tree? The answer was 10 years ago. Uh, you know, and, and so when I hear about the urgency of uh, getting started, well, it's because it's going to take a while. Uh, so we really do need to get started and, uh, and, and stick with it. Yeah, well said. Thank you, Aaron. Other themes. I see Nate nodding his head. Do you have a comment, Nate, or were you, or were you, uh, doing other, taking care of other things. <laughs> Just in total agreement with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything else you noticed, Nate? Any other themes you noticed? 
Um, just that breaking the mold of uh, addition to multiplication, like um, not just the practice, but the mindset and where it's not, it's not necessarily about us and, and where we can engage and then disengage in terms of letting God do what, what only he can do and where we're not the, the answer people is, is, seems to be a really key thing here. Yeah. No, that, that's brilliant. And that theme did come out repeatedly, didn't it? Um, is people like addition to multiplication. Anybody else want to comment on that or add something your group discussed related to that? Jim, Jim Hunter put in the chat here too that he liked to seek the willing, not the equipped. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Um, I, I want to pick up on the addition to multiplication some. Um, you know, addition is a good thing. And we all learned addition before we learned multiplication. Um, so, you know, when, when we think about addition, you know, when we talk about multiplication, we're not saying addition's bad. <laughs> What we're saying is, you know, I don't know, when do you learn multiplication, third grade? Um, but, you know, it, you, do you remember doing that? Do you remember the times table? Do you remember carrying over numbers? And basically, you had to learn to add first, but, but there's so much more you could do when you learn to multiply. Um, so that's one way I've, you know, I've found, I guess I just encourage myself uh, when I think about it, like, okay, yeah, no, this is good. It's not like we're saying we're getting rid of the evil addition. No, we had to learn to add first. Um, but now we're learning to multiply. You know, God's put things in our hearts, put things in our lives. And we've added things like that to people's lives. But now he wants to learn, teach us how to multiply those things. Okay, yeah, other, um, uh, Jim mentioned, seek the willing, not the equipped. And uh, I, that some people put, you know, I forget how you worded it. Some of the rest of you, you know, talked about it's, it depends on ordinary people, not extraordinary people. I mean, I think that was repeated. Maybe each of the groups repeated that in some way. Um, Thoughts on that, observations on that. If you wait for people to be fully equipped or ordained or taught or have so much experience, uh, from my understanding and little bit of experience I have and stuff, you're basically cutting everybody off at the knees because it's, it's more about obedience. So whoever's taking the lessons uh, things out of scripture and immediately apply them and teach others to apply them. That's how things start developing faster. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, well worded, Mike. Yeah. Others thoughts on that. I found it so comforting uh, or helpful just thinking that we don't learn all of these six habits all at once. I mean, we can learn about them all at once, but um, as I've been trying to train earlier, I was trying to train a, a group of pastors, all of the disciples, and to do all the disciples, all of these uh, habits all at once. And, and we just that idea of, of, you know, coming around at these multiple times makes it so much more, it makes so much more sense and, and that we learn them uh, and we have to keep revisiting each of these and, and different people are going to pick up different aspects uh or different habits uh in maybe a different order even mm -hmm. uh, but we have to persevere in getting uh people to understand all of them so that was just really helpful yeah thanks rick yeah and that was the thing too was it there was a lot of a lot of you mentioned perseverance or i think one of the teams said uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint, something like that. Um, anybody else want to add comments on that? 
Yeah, I'd like to add a comment about um, the um, willing versus uh, the equipped. Um, my thought about equipped is uh, maybe they're equipped in under the old paradigms. It's not going to really foster um, a multiplying movement. And so uh, they're not going to listen to us anyway. So that's why the willing people are the ones you want. They're like fresh, fresh dough. <laughs> right. I think one Jesus, thing to sure. add. Oh, sorry. Um, just one quick thing to add is, in addition to being willing, though, I think, um, I think we mentioned we also have to make sure that before we can make disciples, we have to be disciples ourselves and make sure that we have a strong, firm foundation. So I think, in addition to being willing, um, it's like being willing, but then also making sure that you are being invested in and you have a firm foundation before trying to build that in someone else too. Yeah. Um, so not just focusing on, okay, I'm willing if you're not ready as well. Yeah, you, good, good, Marianne. Yeah, you're a learner. You're not just, you're not just imparting to others. You're, you're continuing to learn from others. Amen. I was saying Jesus sure had the habit of picking the most unlikely of people that everyone else skipped by uh, for, to be his disciples. And yet I obviously, or honestly, so often do the exact opposite. Um, and so it kind of connects with what we're talking about, picking the ordinary. Mm -hmm. For our group, um, Jim, we were talking about as we were processing um, what what it all means, and especially with the whole idea of the longevity and that it, um, Roy and your YouTube, what you mentioned about maybe even 10 years until lasting fruit, um, that just how much this is not about results or um, that it, this really is a way of life. And one of our um, members just commented like, this is Christianity. This isn't just a, an, an idea or something to sign up for. This is being a disciple and making disciples. And in lieu of what you shared in Matthew 28 for us to read that it's just, this is, this is what it means to be a Christian. So I feel like that it was simple, but it's not easy um, to, to accept that, but it was good. Mm -hmm. Thanks, JC. Yeah, so other other themes, any other themes that like were re, uh, mentioned repeatedly that, that we should pick up on? This is similar about um, the ordinary versus the ordained, but um, one of the things that I wrote down from the Matthew 28 passage was that Jesus used those um, that worshiped him as well as those that doubted him. And it's really easy for us to look for those on fire Christians that are like, pouring out their lives for Jesus and think, oh, there, there's a person I'm going to pour into and totally overlook people that are questioning and doubting in their own journey. And we kind of write them off. And mm -hmm. so that was a great reminder today to be like, man, make sure that we give just as much attention to what God's doing in the doubter as well as the worshiper. Yeah. Wow. Powerful. Okay. I got um, there's no one insight I'm looking for, but it, was there another theme that maybe was repeated that maybe your group had and you saw other groups had or something like that? I think something that was brought up by each member of our team and um, was just the importance of obedience that is uh, just mm. in all of it. I mean, it mentioned with Jesus, he modeled obedience. His disciples were obedient. It's in the Matthew passage. It's just obedience everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think another one we saw was just that you don't want to go alone, that oh, yeah. we need to have lots of encouragement in the perseverance. And then um, we need to have people around us that are constantly encouraging us and like minded. Amen. So oh, I'm glad you, you know, I'm glad you guys brought these out. Those are just pivotal. This is a, it's a team dilemma. It's a team sport or whatever, isn't it? One Sometimes in the training, um, I like to point out how Jesus immediately, you know, Jesus begins his ministry in Mark chapter one, verses 14 and 15, and he starts gathering the team in verse 16. You know, so I'm kind of like, Jesus needed a team 
to fulfill his calling. I need a team. You know, I need to be a part of a team even more so. Um, okay, we're going to transition now. These were great, um, really rich. And I'm going to share a case study. So Roy and I talked about this as we were preparing, and we talked about different alternatives for doing this. And we just decided, I'm, re I'm going to share my own case study from my own church. So you, when, you, when I'm done with this, you're going to talk about what I should have done differently, OK, <laughs> and what I did right. So each team's going to like, hey, here's three. I, it's kind of late, but actually, you could give me advice for the future. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to give you a bit of a background, but uh, leading up to 2015, you can kind of ignore this stuff before 2015. Okay, but there's a couple things I need to tell you before uh, 2015 for you to kind of understand what God's doing. Um, but then I'm just sharing my experience of learning to make disciples and then what does that mean for my own church? And so we decided this, I think last week, we talked about this like 10 days ago and the whole story took a totally unexpected twist yesterday. So I'll get to that. Um, so let me share a screen here. Um, yeah, so this is my journey, my just, learning to make, you know, I'm still on this journey, but this is my journey of learning to make disciples that make disciples in central Illinois. Um, so first of all, my wife and I, we just, we've been passionate for disciple making, you know, for over 35 years. And um, we do all kinds of different approaches. We, I, I don't think any of you in this group have tried discipleship more ways than I have. I mean, we've done it one-on-one, -on -one, we've done it with new Christians, we've done it with leaders, we've done it with mini groups. Uh, you know, I've used Greg Ogden's material and Ralph Neighbors' material and James Bryan Smith's material um, and other materials. And um, I mean, many of them have been good, but in, my wife did her master's thesis on how do churches best make disciples? I mean, we've just been pursuing this. Uh, you know, we've done it early in the morning and late at night with men and women and, you know, um, all kinds of different ways. And we've seen awesome things happen, but we were always frustrated because we did not see it replicate uh, in an ongoing way. You know, some of the people we discipled um made disciples and that was cool but it never like hey wait then they're just you know then the, the it's supposed to multiply you know and we never saw it like get traction and go viral and we even wrote books on discipleship so in some of them uh, that's what these books are some of them have been translated into other languages and everything um and i think they've been helpful but uh, we were always like, wait, there's got to be a better way. Well, then um, two things happened in 2006. Um, a friend of mine, I'd been hearing about church planning movements, and a friend of mine was like, Jim, hey, um, I'm helping a radical Missouri Synod Lutheran people start a church planning movement in Tanzania. And I'm getting these Missouri Synod Lutheran pastors together at my cabin in Tennessee with Victor John. So Victor John, there's like two like outstanding names uh, that like are the pioneers and it's David Watson and Victor John who were partners in this in Northern. So he's like, hey, we're getting together uh, with these people and at my cab, at my log cabin in Tennessee, come come hang out with me. So this was in September of 2006. And I wrote up extensive notes on this. And uh, it didn't change my life, but it, it changed Roy's life. Huh, I don't know how you got a hold of those notes, Roy. Um, but I shared them with some friends. And then um, somebody called me like in like 
hey, can I put this on the internet? Somebody I didn't know, you know, I don't know how they'd gotten them. But anyway, I was like, this is really interesting, but I, I can't totally get my head around this. I'm gonna keep my eyes on this. Um, yeah, but it, so it, it kind of like, it, I don't know, it, 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 it was a brain whack, but it didn't really get me um, on a new track. But then something else happened in 2006. In the following month, um, and a few of you have heard this story, but I've, I had a dream, which this has never happened to me before or after, but I had a dream that was so real, it was more real than when I'm awake. And in the dream, I was in this amazing building and it was spectacular. Everything was marble. And they led me to a room in this building with no windows and it looked like a funeral parlor. And they said, Jim, leave the funeral. Well, I'm a pastor, I've led funerals, you know. But all of a sudden this building that was fabulous um, was repulsive. It was a place of death. And I, and I thought, I need to get out of this building. Well, what it said to me is we had just, our church had just this built an $8 million, thousand seat auditorium. And um, what the, the dream said very powerfully to me was get out of your beautiful building. Don't try to bring people to your building. Go to where the harvest is and plant churches. Um, so I was a small group pastor at our church and any place we had, um, like any place we had uh, four or five small groups, I was like, hey, let's start a church here. And over the next 10 years um, or so, we planted 12 churches. What happened was nothing, uh, nothing changed. It, the, you know, the, the dream like became true because I did not, uh, there's no more people in that, in that building now than there was in 2006, but there's thousands of people in the new churches that were mostly planted in rural Illinois and Indiana, but some were in like Chicago and larger cities. Um, but anyway, so I, I didn't become a church planner, but I became the missions pastor of our church in charge of missions and um, church planning. You know, they're like, okay, you're no longer the small group pastor, you're the missions pastor. Well, what happened then was in 20, 15, um, I got exposed to disciple making movements firsthand because I was, I was just visiting my daughter on vacation in the Dominican Republic where she was teaching English. Um, she wasn't a missionary, she was just teaching English. And her church there was uh, just beginning to implement disciple making movement principles. Her little church there, her, her church plant that she was a part of there uh, was doing discovery groups and they were changing the way they do church. And I saw it, I saw it and I thought, this is it. This is how we multiply disciples who make disciples. And it's, I don't know, somehow the fact that it was, um, you know, 1500 miles away instead of 10,000 miles away um, captured my attention. <laughs> and, and also I could see it more clearly. So I, I went on this journey and I, um, I went to California to visit churches. I heard, oh, this is churches in California are doing this. And this, the church at the bottom there is Calvary Church in uh, near San Jose, California, Los Gatos, California. I, um, I went to City Team, you see that chart on the wall, that's Trudy Reed, uh, who was one of the first U.S. pioneers, and that's a, that chart is the, the group she started, and the groups that started out of the group she started, and the churches that started, there's different symbols for churches and different symbols for groups, 
and um, it started to spill across the United States and into other countries. Um, the guy in the upper right is Harry Brown. I interviewed Harry Brown. And um, I showed up in his office. Somebody told me I could interview him. And I showed up in his office 4.30 one afternoon. He's like, what are you here for? I'm like, I'm here to interview you. And he's like, I didn't know you were coming. I'll call my wife <laughs> and tell her I'll be home late. I had no idea he would be my boss someday. Um, but my wife and I, then we just, we just started experimenting. Uh, I changed my men's group to a discovery group format and we changed our co-ed group. And my wife started a, a group in a retirement center near here. And then in, um, yeah, in uh, something happened. Uh, well, I should share something else happened in uh, 2017, and I was I was the missions pastor, and I was in Africa, and I felt like God said, uh, "You should help." I mean, before I went to Africa, I felt like God said, "You should help plant churches among Muslim unreached people groups in Africa." And so I went there, a friend of mine had started to work with City Team. Um, his uh, church in Tennessee had started to work with what was then City Team and is now New Generations to start church planning movements among Muslim people groups. And anyway, I was there and I got excited and we were just, we were just in the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, as it's called in trench. We were just on our way to the airport and we stopped at the world's largest church building there, the a Catholic church building. And I went in and it was the building I was in in my team. I walked into this uh, spectacular building that has more stained glass than any other building in the world. And I was like, this is the building I was in in my dream. And then they took me to the, the place where you buried the bones of popes and saints in um, a Catholic basilica, they took me to a room that looked like a funeral parlor with no windows. And it was the room I went to in my dream. And so I, I basically came home and concluded, I'm not supposed to be a pastor, I'm supposed to be a missionary starting church planning movements among underage people groups. But meanwhile, I, Vicki and I kept like, how do we do this in Illinois? So I, um, as you get into this, you maybe have realized this, but maybe you're new to this. It all hinges on finding the people that God is drawing. It all hinges on finding the persons of peace. So um, Vicki and I, my wife Vicki and I, we had, we had been doing all kinds of things in our neighborhood. And we had been praying for our neighborhood. And the last neighborhood we lived in, it worked. You know, we did block parties and ice cream socials and Super Bowl parties and parents. And um, we were reaching our neighbors. Uh, but the neighborhood we live in now, none of that was working. You know, we were, do we were praying, actually praying more and doing a lot of the same things, but it wasn't working. So as I prayed about it, I felt like God said um, this verse, he impressed on me, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointing me to proclaim good news to the poor. And I, I felt like God said, Jim, Jesus died for everyone, but there's a special anointing in reaching the poor. Um, this is like Jesus, Salvo when he opens his ministry in Luke 4, when he comes out of the wilderness. So I started to serve in the food pantry at our church, and I met this, um, I told the person who leads our food pantry, um, I'm not going to pass out tomatoes like I have in the past. I'm just going to pray for people. Because I was looking for spiritually hungry people. And um, I was having fun doing that. And in August of 2018, um, this man, Armando, who's a DJ, as you can maybe tell, um, I said, how can I pray for you? And he said, 
he pulled out his iPhone and, and opened Google Translate and said in Spanish, I want to receive Christ. So I thought this is maybe a live one, you know? Um, and I don't, uh, I know a little Spanish, but not very much. And um, so I, uh, I, I said, you pray in Spanish, I'll pray in English. Um, but uh, his, his prayer, um, you know, didn't sound like it should have or whatever. But anyway, I said, would you like to study the Bible together with me? and learn more about Jesus? And he said, yes. So I called our youth pastor and I said, hey, I got this guy. And again, so this is after 2015. And I said, I got this guy. I want to start a Bible study with him. And our youth pastor's wife is, uh, speaks Spanish. She's Latina. She, her family's from Nicaragua. So I like, who, who could help me start a group with Armando and he's like oh you should have Juan help you he's from South Texas so Juan Juan is the nurse in this picture Juan and I met with Armando and we started a group and you can tell we met uh, usually we'd meet at a restaurant um, now one thing I want you to understand if you don't uh, we this is one thing that we need to change in our maps. Um, there's three types of turf. When you're dealing with seekers or new Christians, there's your turf, their turf, and neutral turf. So I thought, I'm going to start this on neutral turf. So we started uh, this on neutral turf. And um, so once there to the left is Armando's neighbor, Dinah. And Dinah, um, who's African-American but speaks fluent Spanish, <laughs> she invited her African-American friend who speaks Spanish. And um, my daughter is there visiting. She lives in Mexico. And she invited her friend from Guatemala, Guillermo, um, so anyway, this could grow. But um, what I want you to know is Armando came to our church and he's like, Tim, I cannot understand what, I can't understand the sermon. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know English. Um, so he brought people to church. He brought his son. He brought uh, people from his English class, Koreans and Chinese. Um, and he's like, I'm not going to get involved in your church um, because I, get, I don't know what's going on. Um, but he got baptized then uh, New Year's Eve of, uh, in a hotel um, 2018, okay? Um, well, then what happened was, you know, I kind of had this map in my mind, you know, like I start this group with Armando and um, Armando starts discovery groups with his, his friends and his family. Um, and I should share that when uh, I, I thought, oh, maybe I should have done this not on neutral turf, but on his turf. So uh, we started meeting sometimes in Armando's house, sometimes in Juan's house. Um, and when we'd be in Armando's house, I would meet the people we were praying for. His friend who had just come out of prison, who was living in his spare bedroom. I met his son, Jose, who we prayed for, who hadn't had a job for two years. In the week we prayed for him, he got a management job, uh, better than any job he'd ever had. And, you know, so when I was on his turf, I'd see his people. Um, well, anyway, uh, but then things unfolded in a way I didn't know. And one thing you should know is sometimes the person you find is not the person of peace. Sometimes you, the person you find leads you to a person of peace. Well, in this situation, I was kind of surprised because the, you know, Armando was gathering people, um, 
but one had more potential to gather people. And one came to me one morning, we met for breakfast on a morning other than our group. And one's like, Tim, um, the pastor, you know, this pastor, our youth pastor, who had become our small group pastor, he's like, he wants me to start an uh, alpha in Spanish. So I, I was kind of torn, you know? Um, and he's like, we're not gonna do, alpha, we're gonna do a four week alpha. I don't know if you know much about alpha, but alpha is designed to be done in 10 weeks. And, um, you know, I felt really torn. And, but I felt like I should just tell him, um, you know, I wanted him to start discovery groups. <laughs> but he, He's like, we're doing Alpha at the church. We're gonna have food there. I'm gonna do a Spanish Alpha while they do a um, English Alpha. You know, there's food, there's childcare. Um, so he, um, he does Alpha at the church. Uh, three people come to Christ and are baptized. Um, well, then, then he starts doing discovery groups and then he starts doing a monthly potluck and um after he then one gets one gets spanish translation going at our church he's like we've got chinese translation at the second service let's do spanish translation at the first service we've got the headsets we've got the armando started coming to church he he had tried um and basically what we found out was there are good spanish no, there are Spanish-speaking churches in town, but they're all legalistic. I mean, like they don't celebrate Christmas. And if you're a woman, you have to wear skirts and um, that kind of thing, which is very, very common in um, Latino churches. Um, but anyway, what, but then this is like, uh, you know, Juan's doing, you, you can guess. Right now, Juan has Zoom discovery groups going and people are joining from um, Mexico, you know? But in this picture, there's people from Honduras and Guatemala and Colombia and um, California. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where things have gone. But then meanwhile, um, Armando hasn't started a discovery group, but he started a Christian online radio station. So you want to listen to uh, superb Latino worship music and Christian um, input. Armando, who's been a DJ for 30 years, started a Christian radio station. Um, so I, I was kind of disappointed, you know? I wanted him to start a um, discovery group and then those discovery groups, this, start discovery groups. Meanwhile, um, you know, the church I've been on staff on for 20 years um, really is kind of not paying much attention to what's going on. And um, I'm kind of like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of like, I'm not going to say much until they say, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not, uh, um, I just felt like God said, Jim, you help, you keep helping with church planning. You keep working with outlying areas. Don't worry about the town you live in. Um, and um, anyway, um, just like this month, um, the small group pastor contacted me and said, can the executive pastor and I meet with you? And they met with me yesterday. And they said, Jim, um, what we're, we've been in Alpha Church in a small group church and what we've done uh, for basically uh, 40 years. We've done Alpha for 25 years and small groups for 40 years. Um, it's not working. 
it's it's yeah, and I don't know if the COVID thing kind of fit into it, but they're like, we want to meet with me with you. So they met with me yesterday, um, even after I decided to do this case study, and we talked, and um, you know, they were just like, you seem to be real involved in this. You seem to be on the cutting edge. How do we make disciples that make disciples? So this is what I told them. Um, let's just start small. Let's just start with a small group of innovators. Let's not, and, and you know, so the small group pastors like, what if we, I have a budget. What if we do discovery group at the church, like we've done Alpha at the church, and we supply um, food and childcare. And I was like, well, you know, I think, I, I, you know, good things would happen if you did that, but it's not going to multiply. You can't multiply that. Um, don't mix and match. He's like, what are the essentials? And, you know, I, I showed him the chart. There's these, these seven essentials, God's heart, prayer, engaging, finding people at peace, um, guiding people to discover what God's saying in the Bible, forming, uh, letting God form people into his church and multiplying leadership. And so I said, let's not mix and match. Um, and you need all the essentials and keep everything you do. Let's keep asking. I've learned this from Roy. Let's keep asking of everything we do. Does it multiply? If an ordinary uh, person who's somewhat new to Christ can't do it, let's, you know, let's question everything we do and then um, realize that this is going to take, I'm like, if we're not in this for 10 years, um, this is not a quick method. It's a high impact method, but it's a slow method. So this is basically the plan. Um, now, will this happen? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we will train a small group of innovators, maybe a, a few from a few key areas of the church in the habits of making disciple makers. After that, we will do weekly huddles with those people where they're praying together, where they're learning, where they're coaching. We will increase focused prayer for the community. Um, and we will use a disciple making strategy to churches in new counties. Almost all the new churches we started, um, all except one of the 12 new churches we started were in county seats. Um, even, if the, even, if we were in, even if the city was like 100,000, um, or mo most of them were less than 10,000, but some of them were you know, more than, um, like three of them were more than 25,000, but they were all in county seats in Illinois and in Indiana. And so um, we're going to keep looking at counties and maybe county seats and, um, and use disciple making as a strategy. Okay, so what we're going to do now is put you in groups. And um, what could I have done? Did, what did I do? What were some things I did right? And what were some things I should have done differently? Okay, so... Um, let me look at our schedule here. Uh, yeah, so let's do this. Um, let's give them 15 minutes, Marcus. Excellent. So 15 minutes and the questions are in the chat. And we're going to use the same process again with your PowerPoint files. If you would make sure you have a scribe in your group and we'll have some other different groups share with us this time when we come back together. So here we go. Well, uh, guess what? None of us on our team know how to run that PowerPoint thing. So, cause up here in Northern Wisconsin, we're still using <laughs> birch bark off the tree for stick'em notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we love you, Ross. <laughs> Yeah, there's this, we know you have internet, Ross, or you wouldn't be on the call. No, <laughs> this, I'm just a figment of your imagination. I like that. Oh. <laughs> Too funny. So 
Does, does somebody from Ross's group there, the uh, Northwoods Vineyard Team <laughs> 2, want to share your highlights of what three things Jim did right, three things he did wrong? Remember, he gave us permission to criticize, so we're not, we're not doing anything. Yeah. Here. <laughs> well, I was, the, I was the scribe, so uh, I did etch some things down on, in granite here. Um, okay, things, things Jim did right, okay? Um, he was, he um, is extremely persistent. He remained steadfast to his calling, so hats off to you, Jim. Um, you were smart enough when visiting your daughter's church in the Dominican Republic that you saw something different and you'd be willing to hear from the Holy Spirit and change direction. Okay. Okay. Um, now the church is looking to you. <laughs> you were smart enough to keep your mouth shut until the Holy Spirit got a hold of those people and rattled their cage. And now, uh, you know, you, you're the one who's laying the strategy out for that place. And big kudos to you, Jim. And then um, the other thing is uh, just a practical thing of showing us that chart from that woman in California of her multi-generations. And our, our advice for our team is let's get that chart and put it up in our house to remind us that this is the potential of what we can do here in America. So anyway, so those are three or a number of things you did right, Jim. Okay, now to um, taking the stick after you. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, it seemed to us that you're trying too hard uh, to find someone to do uh, the multiplication. You know, in other words, um, our, our advice to you, Jim, is be careful of the expectations you put on people because they might not be God's expectations. Okay, you know, cool. Or whatever it's worth, mm -hmm. especially when you're dealing with a person of peace or a potential person of peace. Um, yeah, and um, just uh, your early part of your ministry, you were asking a question, you know, what I was doing, was it reproducible or not? But now you're asking that question. So, but hey, I asked myself that same question, 40 years ministry, you know, did I, what I was doing, was it reproducible? But, you know, you came to that conclusion that you needed to shift. So anyway, there we go. Okay, cool. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Who's Rob. next, Marcus? We're going to the Trinity Stanley crew. So who is our scribe from Trinity? Do we have, was that? Sorry, I'm working on it. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's okay, Ryan. We can come back to you, Ryan. No, no, I got it. I, I was, I was feverishly getting the PowerPoint done. Oh, good work. Okay, uh, here, let me, let me uh, share video here, start video, something like that, so you can. All right, now share screen. Oh, PowerPoint, share. I kind of know what I'm doing. Okay, cool. So I'll, I'll start with the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Things you could have done better. Uh, we didn't really come up with anything. <laughs> Oh, come on. You see that? All right. <laughs> I didn't really come up with anything. Um, You're very gracious. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, the things that, the things that we loved, um, Jim, you were willing and obedient. And I think we touched base on that, you know, the last discussion that we had, you know, people that are willing, open, obedient. Um, we loved how we heard um, just kind of your humility, but then just the, the willingness to submit to God's plan, God's way in his timing versus yours. And Ross, Ross kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, open to let God make it happen. You know, we, uh, I know for myself, I try to make things happen and it's, it's, that's not what it's supposed to be, you know? Um, and then, yeah, just that, that patience and that humility, um, just kind of, as you were talking about, Ross touched on a little bit, um, you know, being, being in a church for as many years as you have been, you know, down in that area, um, you know, even submitting to their leadership and stuff too, but just, just waiting, you know, just waiting for God to do what he's doing 
you know, and look, look what happened yesterday, you know, and so you're seeing the fruit and we'll, and God will determine what fruit comes out of, you know, the conversation you had mm-hmm. yesterday. Um, so it's just a lot of, a lot of encouragement spoke to us a lot. Okay, cool. And thankfully you ran out of time on the things I could have done better. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Who's next? We're, we're headed to the Oceanside, sunny Oceanside, California. Okay. Parkside, Parkside community. Hey, hey, yeah, we're just all sitting on the beach here in Oceanside. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Hey, we, uh, we said first thing we love you did right. You were in the fight in the arena. You're going for it. I mean, so, yes, there are better ways to make disciples. But uh, usually that's going to come out of a heart, first of all, to go, God, use me to make disciples. Mm-hmm. So we love that. Uh, learned about their turf. And, uh, and you talked about that, I think, a lot in the context of specifically the poor. That was a huge breakthrough, and we found that to be true as well. That was helpful. Uh, and let God speak to you through a dream and a small church plant in Africa. Just a sense of humility and being open to God, how do you want to speak to me? And those ended up being massive things. And I could see being a guy going, hey, I'm writing books on disciple making. Hey, I'm not going to let a dream tell me what to do. You know. And, and so that was, that was inspiring. Uh, three things you could have done better. Um, and I don't, maybe we missed this one, but you just talk about block parties, worked one place, not another. Um, hey, meet them where they are, study the culture of uh, first going, hey, what's going to work in this place instead of just thinking that whatever I did in one place is going to work in the next place. Mm-hmm. Uh, go all in earlier. Uh, it sounded like you did a lot of DMM-ish. Uh, you know, uh, you, you heard Victor John, which my guess is if you just did what he said, it would have saved you a lot of time. But instead, uh, sure. you know, kind of just floated along with that till a, a lot later. And so being clear on the mission and going all in. And if you would have learned Spanish uh, man, years ago, just think how much more ministry you could do. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> Thanks so much. I mean, the crazy thing of it is by not knowing Spanish, it forced me to, to empower other people. Um, so anyway, sometimes, um, but uh, that was the biggest challenge for me. So thanks, Jim. Very good. Yeah, I think we'd have time for one, or maybe we should just open it up um, because we've got about five more minutes before we're going to do our uh, couple minute closing. Yeah, other other things you might want to add, your group saw that these groups didn't see or um, observations, themes, so let's hear from some others. Jim, I really liked what you said. That was really a theme from uh, earlier in the evening. That you stay, wanted to stay away from the things. Um, well, it was, it was different. Let me, let me get my notes here. Um, you said, if an ordinary person who is new in Christ can't do it, Stay away from it. I like that emphasis again on the ordinary person and what the common person can get done, not the professional or the equipped. Mm-hmm. Very good, thanks. One thing um, I'll just add too. One thing I I learned in hindsight is those three kinds of turf. Their turf. Neutral turf is much better than our turf. Their turf is much better than neutral turf. So you really, and it's one of the big paradigm changes, we, the gospel goes viral on their turf, not on our turf. Um, sometimes we may do things, I mean, there's more miracles in the gospels outside of the synagogue than inside the synagogue. That's, that's another way of like looking at it, you know, if you look at the Gospels. Um, yeah, so other, other comments, thoughts, themes. So feel free to unmute yourself. Um, okay, so from Northwoods, I'll do one thing well that you did right because a lot of it's already been said and then one thing that could have been better. Um, 
we were really impressed, you know, with your prayer life and how you really pressed in and that led a lot of what you were doing, you know, um, that's always an area we can always grow in. Um, but one thing that, you know, we kind of were talking about as far as that could have been better, you know, your story of Armando was really incredible. Um, just the journey of investing in him and what God did, did. And I think something that, you know, in church life and just in ministry, you know, you brought up a point that it doesn't always turn out the way we thought it would. Um, but I would not look the, at that at all as not a success because it's incredible what he is doing with the Christian radio station and just thinking about how the word is going out so mm -hmm. far. We don't even know. And so just, I think that's something for all of us to remember that, you know, we do have you know, we all hear from God and, but it's sometimes it looks different, even in our own lives. Like, I know I'm in a place where I'm like, wow, Lord, I did not see this coming. You know, <laughs> this isn't what I thought we were doing the rest of my life or whatever. So I think, you know, just kind of keeping that, you know, um, in the forefront, like just making sure that we pause to really celebrate what God is doing, even when it maybe doesn't look the way we thought it would. Amen. Thanks so much, Jess. Yeah. Thank you. I was just wanting to mention quickly, I loved it that you were out in the community meeting people where they're at and praying for them and you got involved in you know, the food shelf and other things. And also that you didn't give up on the local church, like, you know, dust, dust off your feet and just, be <laughs> but that continued in the relationships and kept, kept encouraging them. And then God, you know, in his timing worked that all out. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I want to point out, Marcus put in the chat box, he put his email in there. So those of you that did gather your things onto PowerPoints, or even if you just did it on, if you were the scribe for your group and you did it on paper, like take a picture of it and email it to Marcus, because we're going to take a PowerPoint of everything you've done and put it together, and then we'll share that uh, when this is over so that everything is captured. Okay. Um, okay, so I've asked uh, Roy Moran and Dale Stoll um, to read. So we're going to read Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Um, and I told them, you know what, you pick the translation. Um, so they just, uh, it's, it's kind of their choice or what their Bible app open to. Uh, but they're going to read it. Uh, from uh, two different versions, and then we're going to be silent until breakfast and just say, God, uh, what are you saying to me and what are you saying to my team? Those are just kind of the things you can be listening for. God, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to my team? And you're going to talk about those things over breakfast. So Roy's going to go first. Right. Matthew 28, 16 through 20, the uh, ESV. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing him in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Meanwhile, the 11 disciples were on their way to Galilee, headed for the mountain they had set for their reunion. The moment they saw him, they worshiped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. 
I'll be with you as you do this, day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. So Lord, we, we're all here because we want to capture your heart. And so we invite you to speak to us, Holy Spirit. What do you want to say to us personally? What do we, you want to say to our teams? Uh, open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds as we take this time in silence between now and tomorrow morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.